Praise the Lord. It's Wednesday and it's wet and it's wonderful here in northern Illinois on this Wednesday night. Time for our faith lift uh, here at Beacon Hill Church. And boy, are we excited to get together and lift up our faith. And I've got my essential support team here tonight because they are essential uh, in making this production happen. So I'm going to I'm going to be speaking to my essential support team and to the little lambs on the other side of the Mevo. Glory be to God. And uh, glory, glory, glory. Let me open up in a word of prayer. Father, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight, Lord. Thank you for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, Father. Thank you for giving us your eternal word. Thank you, Father, that you've put life in us. And you've translated us out of darkness, Father, and put us into the kingdom of light. Father, I want to thank you that we are new creatures in Christ, made brand spanking new. And Father, up out of our innermost being will flow rivers of life-giving water tonight. Thank you, Father, that our faith is going to be lifted and it continually increases and grows. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. All right. Praise the Lord. We're going to jump into this thing uh, here tonight. Look, uh, if you wouldn't mind looking with me at 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And this would be the letter of Paul the Apostle. Or if you want to get fancy, this is the first epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Corinthians. They came behind in no spiritual thing or gift, and they had uh, an interesting church there in Corinth. Now, you understand that the epistles are letters uh, that are written to the church. You understand that. And if we were to kind of give you some, uh, maybe some uh, basic instruction here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are uh, the gospel, uh, the gospel message according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the Gospels, there's only one Gospel, but the Gospels are open letters, open love letters to the whole world. The epistles are written to believers. And someone wisely said that the epistles are uh, spirit-filled letters uh, written by spirit-filled believers for spirit-filled believers. And so uh, what he's about to say here is to all of us and... Uh, he starts in chapter 3, so I'm sorry, chapter 2, 1 Corinthians 2, verse number 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. That's important. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, because the wisdom of men is good, but it is limited, and it is corruptible. The wisdom of men, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. It's almost like, listen, it's almost like you can't have both. Isn't that interesting looking at it that way? That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. If you're going to operate in the power of God, you might have to tone down the wisdom of men business. Glory to God, man, that's some good preaching right there. That'll explain some stuff for you. You know, the wisdom of men is good, but it can only take you so far. And if you're going to operate in the power of God, you've got to make a choice and a decision. And in verse number six, he said, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect or mature. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught. There again. Further evidence that it's one or the other. Can't have it both ways. Well, that's what Jesus said. You can't serve two masters, right? And then you look at verse number 14. He says, but the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Well, there you go again. It's one or the other. Spiritually discerned. The natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God. That's not so hard to understand, folks. That's not so hard to understand. Uh, but yet, 
and I'm going somewhere with this, uh, yet we have a whole body, a whole group of people who claim to be believers that are operating on a carnal level, a natural level. It goes right into chapter 3, and and look at this in chapter 3, verse 1. Paul says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk, in verse 2, and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able, verse 3, for you are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying, strife, and divisions. Oh boy, we got any divisions going on in today's world? in the circumstances that, I mean, we're smack dab in the center of a whole lot of division, aren't we? We're right in the middle of a bunch of division. A bunch of division. And the divide is so great that there doesn't seem to be any solution. There doesn't seem to be any way to find middle ground. That's where we're at today. But that's where we've always been. And he said, listen... I want to speak to you like spiritual people. I want to speak to you and address you like spiritual people. Um, but I can't. i got to talk to you like you're carnal. Because the, you are carnal. There's envy and strife and divisions. And he said, you're walking as mere men. Well, what's wrong with walking as a mere man? Well, clearly Paul seemed to think that you, you're better than that. You ought to do better. You ought to be better. You ought to think better. You ought to act better. Carnal. Carnal. There's the natural side of things, and then there is the spiritual side of things. It's that way with everything, isn't it? You know, uh, in a later passage of Scripture here in a different book, Paul the Apostle uh, explains that we are a three-part being. You are a spirit. You possess a soul, and you live in a physical body. 1 Thessalonians 5.23, if you're taking notes. And Paul said, I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless. And when I read that one day, I realized, well, man, there's three parts to me. I'm a three-part being. I'm threefold. And, and you're not looking at the real uh, Gary. I, I'm not looking at the real Bam Bam over there. I'm just looking at the earth suit that he lives in. Gary Baker, I'm just looking at your, uh, your earth suit, man. I don't see the real you. In fact, Terry, I've never seen the real you in my whole life. I have never seen the real you because it's the hidden man of the heart. I've never seen the real Russ. I've never seen the real... My, my wife, Valerie, I've never seen the real Valerie. I'd like to think I have, but I haven't. And so you are a spirit being. You will never cease to exist. Never. You're never going to miss a beat. You're never going to stop... You're not, you're not going to miss one second, no matter where you're at. You're going to just continue to live forever and forever. And I know that's kind of hard to wrap your mind around it, but you possess a soul. Your soul is your mind, your intellect, and your emotions. And you live in a physical body. So the reason I bring that up to you is because the carnal believer, the carnal Christian, lives in the two realms known as body and soul. Pretty much. And very few operate at a higher spiritual level because it scares us. It's beyond your comprehension. You can't understand it with the natural. Paul says you can't, you can't get a hold of this stuff naturally. It's of the Spirit of God. It's spiritually discerned. You can't understand this stuff naturally. Don't even try. And yes, we use natural examples and parallels and we tell cute stories and, you know, we have our way of communicating and we want to help you understand deep spiritual truths. We've got to keep it simple. But the reason we're having the problems that we're having right now in this nation is because of too much carnality. There are enough believers in this nation to change everything. You know that, right? There are enough Christians to put a stop to this nonsense that's going on. But we're operating at a carnal level rather than a deep spiritual level. Praise the Lord. Now let me show you what I mean because (laughs) spiritual forces, 
spiritual forces are more real than the things that you see with the physical eye because they were here before natural things were here. God was here before you were. God was here before I was. Well, somebody wants, and, and this is a legitimate question, well, how did God get here? Who, if God created everything, who created God? It's like, well, there, see, that's, that's a wrong way of looking at it. God has always been here and brought us into existence. God has always been here. Nobody created God. You know, we're operating at a finite level. We're operating at this limited level. You know, we have limits, man. We have limits. I can only go so far before I, you know, and you fill in the blank. I can only, I can only take so much before I, and fill in the blank. You know, and the same thing is true when you're hearing spiritual truth. You can only take so much, and then your mind goes tilt, and you need to take a break. But spiritual forces... Spiritual laws, spiritual forces, spiritual principles, they, they don't get suspended during a time of national crisis. They're in operation. So this crisis that we're in, this, this national situation that we got going on right now, spiritual laws and principles have not been suspended. They are in effect. They are operating right now. As we speak, they are operating. And I've said this uh, before a time or two, spiritual problems or spiritual influences require spiritual solutions. You cannot solve a spiritual problem using the wisdom of men. Can't do it. Can't do it. I mean, my goodness gracious. You know, somebody wisely said, we don't have a race problem, we got a sin problem. Absolutely. Got a sin problem is what you got. You know, and I've been accused lately of a lot of things. There's no, happy, there's no middle ground right now. There's no middle ground. You know, I preach this exclusive gospel like Jesus is the only way. Well, that's what the Bible says. My job is to preach the word of God to you. My job is not to do a comparison with world religions and say, now, if this doesn't suit you, let me offer another way to you. How ridiculous is that, Chris? It's totally out of control, man. And here's the thing. I'm called a hater or a bigot or a racist if I stand my ground on this. Well, you're closed-minded. You're darn right I'm closed-minded. I hope you are too when it comes to salvation. I hope you are very close-minded. Are you going to trust your eternal soul and your forever and forever to just any religious thing? Any person? Or are you going to put your confidence and your faith in the Lord Jesus? The last time I checked, he was the only one that died for our sins. Last time I checked, he was the only one that not only died for our sins, but went to hell and then was raised back up again. And then while the disciples were watching, he was taken up into heaven. And the angels actually said, hey, the same way you see him going, he's coming back. And the only thing we're waiting on, church, is that trumpet to blow. The dead in Christ are going to rise first, and we which are alive and remain are going to be caught up to meet them together in the air. And we're going to forever be with him. Now, does that sound a little bit overwhelming and scary? Well, of course it does. I've never seen him physically. I don't know what heaven looks like. I take it by faith. <laughs> you know, but that's the way this thing works. So, spiritual laws and faith principles are still in operation. They're still in effect. They have not been suspended just because we have a pandemic or, or a, a crisis going on. And, and spiritual problems require spiritual solutions. Now, over to James, if you don't mind here, the book of James, good old brother James. James chapter 1. We're talking about now, I made a little bit of a transition here, spiritual forces, spiritual forces, spiritual influences. And I want to introduce something to you. Maybe this is the first time you've heard this. Maybe this, uh, this is uh, one of many times. If you come to this church or listen to this preacher, you hear me speak about some things all the time, don't you? And this is in James chapter 1. It says this, 
Verse 2, my brethren, count it all an insult when you fall into diverse temptations. Oh, no, 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 I don't think he said that. Count it all an offense when you fall into different types of trials and tests and temptations. Count it all a royal pain in the cacoots when you fall into diverse temptations. No, he says, count it all joy. NIV says, consider it pure joy. NET Bible says, my brothers and sisters, consider it nothing but joy. God's Word translation says, be very happy. And the Weymouth New Testament says, reckon it nothing but joy, my brethren, whenever you find yourselves hedged in by various trials. Do you feel like you're hedged in by various trials? Maybe you feel like you're hedged in by various trials. Well, this is certainly a trial that we're going through. And there are many people feeling like they're hedged in. And the Bible says that you should do what? Count it pure joy. Consider it. It doesn't say that it is a happy thing. Anybody who's paying attention in life knows this is a difficult thing we're going through. And some of us are being persecuted for our faith. There was a time not too many years ago, truthfully, I never thought that I would have seen the day when we were persecuted for preaching the gospel in this country, where we would be considered the hater and the racist and the bigot because we lift up the name of Jesus and we refuse to get dragged into a a fight that we don't belong in. I'm not getting drawn into debates with people. I don't care what your position is on life. Well, I believe in evolution. Well, goody, goody gumdrops. Good for you. It's a heck of a thing, the way we've evolved or devolved. I believe in the Big Bang. Well, goody, goody gumdrops. If there was a Big Bang, there had to be a Big Banger. I'm not going to argue and debate such ridiculousness. I got, you know, I had an opportunity to get dragged into a debate with somebody today, and all I did was say something about sports, looking forward to being able to enjoy a game without all this kneeling and standing and don't kneel, don't stand during the national anthem. I don't know how you feel about it, but you know, I want to enjoy a game, and I don't want to get drawn into a political debate. I don't need to have somebody making a statement on the, on the field. Just play the darn game. Now, you may not agree with that. But that's my right to have that opinion. And some people call me a hater because of it. Well, wait till they see the hat that Terry uh, got got on order for me. That's really going to further the divide. My God. Count it all joy. Reckon it nothing but joy whenever you find yourselves hedged in by various trials. See, here's the thing. Joy is a spiritual force. And joy operates independent of circumstances. If you're depending on circumstances, if you're depending on circumstances to make you joyful in life, you're going to be at a disadvantage because circumstances are, right now, uh, for many people, less than ideal. But somehow or other, we can transcend, we can go beyond. We can defy all logic and reason, and we can tap into a spiritual force known as joy. In fact, it says in uh, Isaiah, make a note of Isaiah 12, 3, with joy you will drink deeply from the fountain of salvation. I love that verse. That's Isaiah 12, 3, and the version I gave you was the New Living With joy, you will drink deeply from the fountains of salvation. Well, where are the fountains of salvation? In you. If Jesus Christ lives in your heart, doesn't mean you're going to live a perfect little life. Doesn't mean you're never going to, you know, you're going to never make a mistake again. It doesn't mean you're always going to say the right thing and think the right thing and do the right thing. I mean, you could be laid up in a gutter high and stoned out of your mind 
and Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. I don't believe it. Well, see, you can have heaven in your heart and hell going on in your head. And sometimes hell wins out. Glory to God, just saying. Sometimes we just got to keep it real. You know, people want to act like sometimes, you know, well, that, that just, that's not the way we ought to talk in church. Well, how are we supposed to talk in church? You never did anything wrong, and yet, you know, Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You never did something wrong that you regret it later? Come on. There's forgiveness for you. I mean, instantly. Cleansing and forgiveness, and the Lord says, come on, let's just move on. Forget all that. Some of these sins of the flesh are ridiculous to get hung up on. Glory to God. Joy is a spiritual force, and it is independent of finances, independent of circumstances, independent of people and stuff and position. It's independent because all of the stuff in life is subject to change. It rises and falls. It ebbs and flows. It goes away. It disappears. But the joy of the Lord is your strength. And someone wisely said, joy is the serious business of heaven. I had to counsel somebody, and I've done this many times in the last several weeks. What should be our response when they are attacking us because we refuse to choose sides? In other words, I don't choose sides. You got either, either it's black lives matter or blue lives matter, but it can't be both ways. Well, who said that? Who told you that lie? Where'd you get that from? Who told you that lie? First of all, you want to get technical about it. Don't all lives matter? Didn't he die for all? For God so loved the world, all of us, that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever will believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's not the, that's not the time to choose sides. And if people want to push you into one or the other, you tell them back off. Just back off. But don't do it with words. I'll show you how you do it. You have yourself a laughing fit right in their face. Well, that's a sure way to get you shot. Well, listen, if joy is a spiritual force, and if with joy you'll drink deeply from the fountain of salvation, and if I'm supposed to consider these trials and difficulties as a joyful thing, then if I will stay full of the Holy Spirit, which one of the fruits of the Spirit is, joy, and if I become saturated with the presence of the Holy Spirit, then what will flow out of me is joy so that when they're lying to me and they're accusing me and they're picking on me, mommy, I can start laughing, not because I'm being disrespectful. That's not what I'm talking about, church. I'm not talking about being a disrespectful nut. I'm talking about the, the joy is bubbling so strong that when they accuse you and attack you, you actually have a laughing fit because you see what's going on. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood here. It's, we're wrestling against dethroned spiritual powers. They've already been dethroned. They just found a way to work with people who don't know better. They found a way, the devil has found a way to work with people who just don't know any better. And if you will stay saturated with the Holy Spirit, Paul said, listen, don't get drunk with wine wherein is excess in Ephesians. He said, don't get drunk with wine wherein is excess, but instead be being filled. You know as well as I do, when you get good and saturated with the substance. Now, I don't mean to be graphic. I'm not trying to be vulgar, but, you know, you know you're good and full of water when you do what? Pee. Right? And do you know the color of your <clears throat> pee can tell you a lot about yourself? You know, you don't want to have dark colored pee. You don't want it to be super dark. That tells you something. You can stay hydrated and it'll be a certain... Listen, I'm, I'm just being real with you because spiritual things work the same way, you know. If the, listen, 
if the only time you can even get a few chuckles or a ha-ha is when we come together in church and you're surrounded by other Christians, then you might be dehydrated during the week. That's what I'm talking about. I mean, maybe it's time for you to do a whole lot more drinking and a lot less thinking, like Eric Schert said the other day. More drinking, less thinking. Because it's the wisdom of men that keeps us confused. It's the wisdom of men that's keeping us divided. There is no reason why people are so ugly with each other. It doesn't even make any sense. But spiritual forces transcend and defy all logic and reason. Spiritual forces both to the good and to the bad. And so when you have yourself a laughing fit when they tell you that you're a hater and a bigot and a racist and you just have yourself a laughing fit, they're going to look at you like you are crazy and that you are out of your mind and you can say, I am out of my mind. I'm operating out of the spirit now because with joy I will dwell or I will drink deeply from the fountain of salvation. Drinking deeply. How many of you have a habit of drinking deeply from the fountain of salvation? Well, when I'm in trouble, I do. But don't wait until you're in trouble. You want to drink before you get into a challenge. You want to drink before there's a problem. Uh, in Nehemiah 8.10, it says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. The Amplified renders Nehemiah 8.10 part of that as, and be not grieved and depressed, for the joy of the Lord is your strength and stronghold. Be not grieved and depressed. Well, how am I not going to get grieved and depressed? With joy. The joy of the Lord is how you keep above that. Or do you have to rely on medication? Now, if you do, it's okay for now. But see, the Lord wants to get you to a higher level where you don't have to depend on a substance other than him. That's the higher level. You know, how many times have you heard, and, and I don't mean disrespect, please. I mean, I'm not trying to diss you guys in here tonight. But how many times have you heard people say, oh, man, I've had a rough day, I need a drink. Come on, I'm not looking at anybody, just be honest. I'm looking to the person over here, oh, there is nobody over here. I'm looking to the, oh, there's nobody over there. I know what that's like, I know what that feels like. It's been rough, man, I'm just going to kind of get sauced up a little bit and relax. Exactly, exactly. Start drinking of the Spirit and watch and see what he can do for you. Uh, you, you know that, let, let me show you this in Romans. Um, you guys okay for a few more minutes? Man, I'll tell you what, this 30 minutes just blew right by. Whew, I want to keep you wanting more so I won't be too long tonight. So just let me, let me show you this in Romans uh, 14, if you would, please. Romans 14. And we'll try to uh, conclude here with this. So, so in case you are wondering why we're talking this way, it's because I'm trying to help you during this time that we're in right now. It's confusing, isn't it? I mean, I've got, listen, I talk to a lot of people during the day. Every day of my life, I'm dealing with people's problems. Every day of my life, people need guidance. They need help. They need, they need a spiritual ear to, to listen to them, a spiritual voice to speak to them. And uh, people are in a mess right now. It's hard. And, and I'm trying to show you something. That you can tap into a spiritual force known as joy, and it will lift you above all of the confusion and fear. And in Romans chapter 14, I love this. I love this verse. Verse 17, Paul said, The kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It's not dietary rules, regulations, and restrictions. But what is it then, Paul? Well, the kingdom of God can be summarized this way. Here it is. Righteousness, peace, and joy in ideal circumstances. No, joy in the Holy Ghost. Oh, my. Oh, wait a minute. Joy in the Holy Ghost? You mean God must consider this an essential part of the kingdom? Yeah, because Paul summarizes it and he said, listen, it's not about dietary rules, regulations, and restrictions. It's not about holding other people to your convictions. That's important. The kingdom of God is not about holding other people to your convictions because they're 
your convictions. But the kingdom of God is about righteousness, peace, and joy. It's joy in the Holy Ghost, not in a religious system, not in policies or politics or social standing. And when you reach the saturation point, is what I'm trying to tell you, this joy will flow from you being saturated with the Spirit of God. So really, if, if you want to know perhaps maybe what your issue is right now, is that you are completely stressing because you are absorbing the wrong thing. Let me just pause for effect. If you would go on a bit of a sabbatical and take a break from Facebook, take a break from the news, you might be surprised at what starts happening to you. You get clear-headed. The anxiety seems to diminish. Now, I'm just being honest with you guys. There's so much anxiety that's coming to you through Facebook, social media, through the news, and and I, I don't care which news outlet you want to uh, refer to here. Uh, I'm just telling you, whatever news source you use, if, if you would get saturated with the Holy Spirit more than you get saturated with CNN or Fox or BBC or whatever, you're going you're gonna to notice a big difference. And here's the thing. The people of the world need us to operate out of this joy because the people of the world do not have hope. The people of the world are in a tailspin. There's no hope right now. It's a very scary time. And, and I'll tell you what, I mean, it shouldn't be this way. It should not be this way. There is no logical explanation for it. It is a spiritual problem. It requires a spiritual solution. But here's the thing. Church, you are the spiritual remedy. You are the body of Christ. You are the spiritual remedy for this world. But if you are just as overwhelmed and just as anxious and just as burdened, then what good are you doing? I, I mean, listen, I'm just being honest with you. I get phone calls and immediately the anxiety level goes up because this is what I get on the other side of the phone. Did you just hear what my mama? And I'm like, OMG, not again. I can't have this conversation again because it's not just one person calling me or texting me <clears throat> or reaching out to me. I, can, I should probably just get a recording of my voice and say the same thing. Do a whole lot more drinking and a lot less thinking. Repeat. Do a whole lot more drinking and a lot less thinking. Repeat. Do a whole lot more drinking than you do thinking about this. God's going to cover, God's going to just, God's going to take care of you. You don't have to get into fear. Just listen to him. He'll tell you what to avoid and where to go. Um, you know, I referenced a, a situation earlier. I, I totally backed down when I realized where it was going. Somebody wanted to take it down the road. It was not supposed to go down, you know, um, because it immediately went from, you know, a lack of disrespect to the flag and those who died defending it, it, and then it turned into a rant against cops. And I thought, oh, whoa, whoa, hold on. We ain't going down that road. We're not doing that. Don't even, because I'll just walk away. And maybe that's what it's going to come to, is a whole lot more drinking and a lot less thinking. And so... We can give you drinking lessons. I guess that's probably the good, good way to end today's segment here, is we can give you drinking lessons. And I'd like to be able to do that as we conclude. But here's the thing. It may not be like you think it's going to be, but you have to trust me because I specialize in these things. Did you know that I'm a specialist in the spirit-filled life? Did you know that God sent a Pentecostal specialist here to be a pastor of this Pentecostal church? So what are you saying, Pastor? There's some things that I've learned the hard way that I'd like to teach you and show you how to do it. I can show you how to stay full of the Holy Spirit, and it's not by sitting on Facebook. That ain't going to work. Do you, you don't ever go on Facebook? Of course I do. That's how I stay connected to some of you knuckleheads. I mean, some of you wonderful people. Da-da-da-da. Glory to God. 
And that's not the church of the future. Don't let people lie to you and tell you that that's what it's come to. No, because some assembly is still going to be required for the body of Christ. We cannot be assembled together virtually. We have to come together. And I look forward to the day when we can have everybody assembled here and we can be back together like we were. But it'll be better than it's been because we're not going back to what it used to be. That was... That was then. This is now. This is a new season, okay? So, to summarize real quick, do more drinking and less thinking. And if you don't know how to, well, I got good news for you. We can teach you and we can show you. But it's not going to happen long distance. Get that out of your head. We can help you. Some of you might just have to get on a plane and come out here. Who am I talking to? I don't know, somebody in Mevo land. You might just need to get on a plane and come on out here and hang around us for a little bit. Because have you ever noticed that you become like the people you hang around? Have you noticed that? It's true. It's true. I said one time to somebody, I said, bad company corrupts good character. And they said, that ain't right. That's a lie. I said, it's in the Bible. It ain't, it ain't a lie. It's the truth. Well, I don't believe it. Well, whether you believe it or not, it's still true. You become like the people you are connected to. And if you hang around faith long enough, it rubs off on you. If you hang around failure long enough, it rubs off on you. So, Father, I want to thank you for your word. Father, your word is, is light and it's life. And, Father, our faith grows exceedingly. Faith comes by hearing and by hearing and by hearing your word. So we thank you for your precious, holy, written word. And we thank you, Lord Jesus. You said it wasn't good for us to be alone, that you were going to send another comforter, another helper, that he would abide with us forever, that he would abide with us, he'd be in us, he'd be upon us for service, for an endowment with power from on high. So, Father, I thank you for the Pentecostal advantage. I thank you that we are people of the Word and we are people of the Spirit, and we are doing exactly what you've asked us to do, Father, to preach faith into them, and to love hell out of them. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. I love you. I bless you. Look forward to seeing you soon.